the resurrection. This morning I'd like to also then go back to Mark chapter 14 and look at some of the characters in the Easter story. And we can't look at everything, every detail of the life of Jesus and the crucifixion. But there's a few points, uh, characters that I want to just talk about this morning. And I know I have probably have way too many notes to fit into time. I uh, want to talk a little bit about the religious leaders. I want to talk about Mary, who came to anoint Jesus when he was sitting at the Simon the leper's house. I want to talk about Judas. And then also the meaning of the Passover. And uh, focus on that. Talk about Peter, the guy that was so self-confident. And uh, then Pilate, who claimed that Jesus was innocent, but was pressured by the mob to give in and allow Jesus to be persecuted. We could talk about uh, many others. Joseph of Arimathea, who followed Jesus in... Um, in but in seclusion and didn't really want to reveal himself as a follower of Jesus. And then also the resurrection. I want to close with the resurrection. So in your Bibles, Philippians chapter 3, 9 through 11, <clears throat> Paul writes about the resurrection and the power of the resurrection. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the, law, the, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Then he, very familiar verse, he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Let's pray. Father, we are before you this morning. We've come together to commemorate your death and suffering, which Paul commands us to do until you return again. And we were reminded this morning of the prophecies have been fulfilled of the, the prophecies of the death and the suffering of Jesus. And he has ascended, you have ascended to heaven, and you are watching your Father in heaven. You're interceding for the church, praying for the church, and you are waiting to hear from the Father to return and receive your bride. We are your inheritance, Jesus, and we thank you for that. We're not worthy, but we come to the communion table this morning made worthy by faith in you, Jesus, and the cross work that you have done and the, also the power of the resurrection in our lives. So, Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth this morning and partake of the, the bread and the grape juice that is symbolic of your broken body and your shed blood. And then as we sit together and wash each other's feet, Lord, help us to remember the meaning and the example that you set for us in being a servant. And you have come to serve, not to be served. And we want to follow your example in that. We honor you this morning. Speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 14 begins with uh, talking about two days. In two days, after two days was the feast of the Passover of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they could kill Jesus. And as I, I thought about that, I, I tried to look at who the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees were. They were a group of religious leaders. And... They were appointed by God, even back when the Israelites left Egypt. Moses appointed the Levites to be the priests and to lead the 
or represent the God's people in worship and making sacrifices and offerings to God. And now we see as the life of Jesus was, Jesus was upon the earth and he was ministering and healing and teaching and affecting and influencing the lives of many. Everybody that he came in contact with, uh, it seemed like their lives were changed. We, we read about many who were influenced by Jesus. And of course, <clears throat> these religious leaders were constantly accusing Jesus, trying to find fault with him, with his teaching, with his miracles. When he healed on the Sabbath day, he was accused. Uh, he was popular amongst the people. And we could go back to the story when he rode into Jerusalem and how the multitudes laid down palm branches and laid down their, their clothes, their cloaks. And they had a donkey that Jesus rode on that never a man had sat on before. And as he, he rode into Jerusalem, they were shouting and singing praises, Hosanna, King of the Jews. And of course... This really disturbed and made them angry. And uh, we read here that in, in as they arrested Jesus in verse 53 of chapter 14. And they led Jesus away to the high priests. And with the high priest, uh, and, and they were assembled together. All 72 of the Sanhedrin were assembled together. And the elders were together. And uh, there they accused Jesus of blasphemy because he said that he was the Son of God. And he, had, uh, he testified that he was the Son of Man. This was a group of people that were entitled. They loved authority. They loved position. And they were very jealous. And if someone did not fit into their protocol, they were ousted. They were not welcome to be in their midst. They loved the temple. And uh, they ruled over the people. They were responsible to, to interpret the laws of God to the people. And so they ruled with an iron fist. And like I said, position and authority was very important to them. It was apex in their minds. And... Uh, Annas, the high priest who was retired, loved to control the Sanhedrin even though he was retired. And everyone seemed to tiptoe around them, afraid to uh, approach them, afraid to speak out against them. But Jesus was not afraid to do that. And he had more rebu rebukes in the Gospels for the, for the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin than he had for anyone else. And so these religious leaders who were appointed by God got together and in craft, the Bible says, in a, in a sly way, they decided to, they're, they're, they wanted to find a way to crucify Jesus. And of course, these were the men that Judas came to to find a way and plan a way to betray Jesus. And we know this later in the life of Judas after he realized that he had betrayed innocent blood he came back to these religious leaders with remorse that he had done wrong. And here was a group of religious leaders that had no answer for him. They could not help him. They interpreted the laws of God. They explained the laws of God to people. And they told people how to live. And they ruled over them with iron fists. Yet they did not have an answer for a man that was despondent in despair and realized his wrong that he had done. And they said, what's that to us? 
Then in uh, Mark chapter 14, we have a woman with an alabaster flask of ointment. John identifies her as Mary, the sister of Martha, and the sister of Lazarus, who was raised from the dead. And this act that Mary performed in the house of Simon the leper, who Jesus had healed, and Simon had invited Jesus and the disciples into his house for a meal. And this act that Mary performed in anointing Jesus in preparation for his death and burial really exposed the heart of Judas in a real way. It was probably a long necked bottle. A, a bottle made of marble. And the way the bottle was used was you turned it upside down and had a small hole in the top of the neck. And you'd have to shake the bottle to get the perfume out. And Mary probably did not empty the perfume that was in the bottle. The perfume was spikenard or pure nard which uh, the oil was made from nard plants that came from India. Possibly. Very possible. And which made it very costly. And uh, it was worth a hundred, uh, 300 denarii or a year's wages is what this perfume was worth. But Mary did not shake the bottle. She broke the bottle, the top of the bottle off. And, and to the men that were sitting there and seeing this, probably Simon the leper and, and Judas and the rest of the disciples, they thought and expressed themselves as what a waste this was. And, and Mary anointed Jesus' feet. Probably Jesus was sitting on the floor by in front of us a, a low table and had his feet probably crossed and extended behind him. And Mary probably came up behind Jesus and anointed his feet. This was an act and an expression of sincere and total devotion to Jesus. Mary even probably did not totally realize what she was doing when she anointed Jesus. Her anointing of Jesus became a symbol of, that anticipated his death and his burial. And of course, it made Judas angry and exposed his heart. And he said, this perfume has been wasted. The money could have been, the perfume could have been sold and the money given or used to feed the poor. Now, Judas, we don't know exactly where Judas met Jesus. The Gospels do not tell us, not like many of the other disciples. And the other disciples were mostly from the Galilean region, north of Israel. Most scholars believe it's the, in the Bible he was referred to as Judas Iscariot. Now, Iscariot was probably not his last name, but it identified his hometown and where he came from. And uh, I believe his hometown was in southern Judea. And... Uh, more of the southern Judean people were revolutionists against the Roman government. And it's very possible that that is where Judas was from. They resisted established government. I don't know, could it be that Judas was attracted to Jesus because he believed that Jesus, the Messiah, or the Son of Man, would one day lead a resistance and a revolution against the Roman government. And that's what attracted him to Jesus. We don't know. 
Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Summoning the twelve, the twelve disciples, and that included Judas. He gave them power and authority over all the demons, over all the demons and to heal diseases. Then he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Judas was in that group. Judas was given power to heal sick, to cast out demons. And he preached the gospel with the disciples. He was empowered by Jesus with authority over demons and over diseases. And then imagine with me this morning what he all witnessed in the three years that he followed Jesus. He saw the the thousands, the multitudes being fed by five loaves and three fishes. He watched Jesus raise the dead. He was present when Lazarus was raised from the dead. He was along when Jesus calmed the raging sea. And the blind received their sight and lepers were cleansed. If you saw Judas with Jesus, he probably would have walked through the marketplace with sold out for Jesus t-shirts. I don't know. Very possible. In today's culture, But we wonder, why did he follow Jesus? Was it for personal gain? Was it for his own benefit? Like I said, his reaction to Mary anointing Jesus with expensive perfume gave us a glimpse of a man with darkness hidden in his heart somewhere. But we do notice in the Gospels, that Judas never addressed Jesus as Lord. The few times that we read about him. He addressed him as teacher and as rabbi. But never did he address Jesus as Lord. How could this happen? Chuck Swindell reminds us that nobody suddenly becomes a villain or villainous villainous overnight. It's a process. It takes some time. One step leads to another. And then one step leads to another. And then finally, another step leads to an act. The gospel writers don't tell much or say much about Judas and we can understand why but Judas story is not about Judas it's about Jesus and it shows us the heart of Jesus especially in the upper room In Luke 22, 21, Jesus says, but, and first of all, he washed his feet with the other disciples. And he said, but behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me at the table. In this culture where Jesus and his disciples were, the breaking of bread signifies the idea that you are my friend and I will not hurt you. And Jesus, knowing that Judas would betray him, washed his feet. Jesus, knowing that Judas would betray him, broke bread and served him at the Passover meal. Even as Judas planned to betray him. Shows the heart of Jesus. And I believe Judas would have had opportunity to repent 
in the upper room if he would have chose to. I believe he could have changed and repented of his plans that he had. Thirdly, let's look at the Passover with his disciples. The bread. Jesus took the bread and said to his disciples, this is my body, which symbolizes Christ's broken and crushed body. To the disciples, it symbolized deliverance from, of the Israelites and their people from Egypt. And Jesus, when he broke the bread and gave them bread, he brought new meaning to eating unleavened bread. In the new covenant, as we break the bread today, it's symbolic of the death of Jesus Christ. And not only is it symbolic of the death of Jesus Christ, but it also points out to us that we can, through the death of Jesus Christ, we can be separated from worldliness and sin. And in this case where Jesus was from false religion. And it also symbolizes the beginning of a new life in Christ empowered by faith and being crucified with Christ. Then Jesus took the cup and he said, this symbolizes my shed blood, the blood that I will shed for you. And to them, again, the disciples, they were thinking back to Egypt and the lambs that were slain the night of the Passover, where the death angel was a, a death angel, we're not sure, but the curse of death was passed on the Egyptians by God. And as the children of Israel took the blood that was slain at the Passover and applied it to their doorposts, they were spared from the curse of death. And Jesus said, This in the new covenant. My blood res resembles your ransom and your deliverance from the bondage of sin and the curse of death that is upon you. Jesus said, My blood in the new covenant, the shed blood, always for a covenant with God, it always required a sacrifice of blood to establish a covenant. And for this covenant, the new covenant in the, in, the new, in the New Testament that Jesus is speaking about, it also required a sinless sacrifice. And Jesus Christ was the only one that qualified to provide a sinless sacrifice to establish the new covenant and to establish our ransom. And Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he said, Jesus was a ransom for many. Ransom, the word ransom there means a price paid to free a slave or a prisoner. It is shed for many. Many mean, meaning all who come believing in Jesus Christ, both Jew and Gentile. <clears throat> then Jesus said, this is the last time that I will eat this Passover with you, the bread, and drink the cup with you. He said, until I will drink it new when I return from heaven and establish my kingdom upon the earth. Larry talked about the return of Jesus Christ. But Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, that we are to practice this ceremony in memory of as a memorial to the death of Christ and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And it points us and reminds us to the cross. It reminds us or points us to the cross and reminds us of the cross, the sacrificial death of Jesus. Jesus' <coughs> physical incarnation his sacrificial death and also his resurrection 
and his coming again. <clears throat> Paul asks us to drink it, but to not drink it unworthily. <clears throat> In Corinthians, he says, do not drink it unworthily. The person who does drink or take communion unworthily uh, is is defaming the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. <clears throat> he says, to come to the Lord's table, clinging to one's sin, dishonors the ceremony, dishonors the body of Christ, and is treating lightly the gracious sacrifice of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so it is necessary to set all sin before before the Lord as we partake of this ceremony this morning. If we do not do that, are not willing to do that, we make a mockery of the tremendous sacrifice that Jesus made. And Paul says to do otherwise is not discerning the Lord's death. And one brings judgment upon themselves in verse 29 of 1 Corinthians 11. Then he says in verse 30, that is why some of the Corinthians, he says that in the Corinth, church at Corinth, he said, that is why some of you are weak and ill and even have physically died. So this morning, <coughs> I would like to ask us all to stand. So stand with me. And let's just take a moment of silence. And open our hearts before the Lord this morning. And allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And if the Holy Spirit speaks to you this morning of a sin that you're holding on to, clinging on to, and not willing to repent of, take this moment in the quietness of your heart and clear yourself before God before we come to the communion table. <coughs> so let's just be quiet before God. Lord, we take this moment to stand before you. And Holy Spirit, we give you the opportunity to speak to our hearts this morning. And we think of worldliness, the sins of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life and the lust of the flesh, and how we are so prone to yield to our own selves and allow sin to rise up in our lives. And Jesus, we come to you this morning in repentance and thanking you for the ransom and thanking you for, the broken for your broken body and that you have set us free and you make it possible that we can live in, in holiness and in freedom before you. And as we come to the communion table this morning, we want to cleanse our hearts with anticipation to celebrate your death and your suffering. Again, Jesus, we thank you for forgiveness and your love to us. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Also in, in Mark chapter 14, we have the story of Peter, the bold Peter, the overconfident Peter. And in verse 27 28, Jesus said unto them, to the disciples, 
All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. And we notice the response of Peter to Jesus very boldly. He says, Lord, even if all these of the disciples are offended in you, I will not. I will not forsake you. Jesus, uh, Peter had a busy week. He was, he just came from the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw the parade going into Jerusalem, Jesus riding into Jerusalem. The palm branches, the crowd cheering. Then being at Simon the leper's house and Mary anointing Jesus' feet. Uh, and he heard about the mystery of possibly Jesus then talking about the cross that was ahead of him and what was before him. But Peter was confident. He was sure of himself. And there were tiny seeds of faith planted in Peter's heart. His confession in Matthew 16, when Jesus asked the disciples, Who do men say that I am? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in John 6, when Jesus talked to his disciples, and he realized, and he talked about many that had been following him, were, were defecting and not following Jesus, and he asked the disciples, Will you also leave me now? And Jesus said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Or Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou, art, thou hast the words of eternal life. And yet in Mark 14, Jesus said to Peter, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even this night, before the cock crow twice, thou wilt deny me three times. And then they went to the upper room, left the upper room, and went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And we know the story how Jesus left his disciples, took Peter, James, and John with him, and uh, left them at a place. And then he went to the, to the, into the garden, and there he prayed with the Father, he wrestled with the Father, concerning the cross that was ahead of him, concerning the idea of being the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And Jesus had a very traumatic experience in praying and even to the point where he was sweating drops of blood. And uh, Jesus came back to his disciples numerous times. Peter, James, and John were fast asleep. And he said, can't you tarry with me for one hour? And finally, Jesus knew his time had come. And he told the disciples, okay, my time has come. The mob was there to arrest him. And we know how, how Peter rose up and tried to defend Jesus. And he cut off the high priest's servant's ear with the sword that he had. And Jesus turned around and said to him, put your sword away. My kingdom is not of this world. And of the kingdom that I am a part of, we do not fight with swords and knives. And then they arrested Jesus. And Peter followed from a distance. And he went into the high priest's house as Jesus was there being tried. And different times, three different times, someone came up to Peter and said, well, you're one of the disciples. And, and we know how Peter denied him in, in, a, in a vehement way. And even he began swearing and cursing this man that followed Jesus. And he denied that he knew Jesus. And then the cock crew. And G Peter went outside and he wept bitterly because of his betrayal or his denial of Jesus. But Jesus later was forgiving towards Peter when he met his disciples after the resurrection. Then we have Pilate and Joseph of Arimathea. And we could talk about Barabbas. Pilate, the Roman governor, appointed by Herod to govern over Judea. 
who was manipulated by the religious leaders. They needed his help to judge and to crucify Jesus because their law would not allow them to do it. And they said that they threatened him if he would not crucify, have Jesus crucified. Pilate tried his best to present and offer Barabbas in exchange for Jesus. Barabbas was a resurrectionist. And he was resisting against the Roman government. And uh, was in prison to be crucified. Be put to death. But the religious leaders said, No, we want Jesus crucified. Give us Jesus, not Barabbas. And so finally, Pilate gave in to their pressures. And Jesus was crucified on the cross. So we have religious leaders, we have chief priests and Pharisees, scribes, planning in a crafty way how they would crucify Jesus. We have Judas defecting as a follower of Christ who had his values, his values were completely turned upside down and for 30 pieces of silver he betrayed his rabbi, not his Lord. 30 pieces of silver were probably four, four months wages so it really wasn't that much money. But he opened his heart to Satan. And Satan entered into Judas, Luke 22, 3 says. And all this we see, this conspiracy and this planning, this craftiness that was, came about to, to crucify Jesus Christ. Nothing of what happened was accidental. Nothing caught the Godhead by surprise. Nothing rattled the windows of heaven. Dan Darling says when he, in his book about the characters of Easter. All this evil work by Satan, working through men, to crucify Jesus was not a surprise to God. Jesus suffered death. John Calvin says, not by constraint, but willingly, that he might be a voluntary sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And Jesus even told Pilate that you cannot crucify me, but the power for you to crucify me has been given to you by God. Now, was Judas responsible? Were the religious leaders responsible? Was Pilate responsible? And the Roman soldiers, were they responsible for their actions? Yes, they were. They were responsible for their actions. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, Paul says that if the princes of this world, the religious leaders... Had they, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And they could have known who Jesus was if they would have not been blind to the prophecies of the Old Testament. They would have recognized Jesus and who he was, that he was the Son of God and that he was the Son of Man. Did Satan know that Jesus would be resurrected? Possibly. That would be an inter interesting conversation to have. John 10, verse 18. In verse 17, Jesus speaks about laying down his life. And then in verse 18, he says, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. So Jesus, even though there was craft, there was, there was planning, there were decisions made by men because of their greed for power, 
and money and wealth. They planned together to betray Jesus and to crucify him. And yet, Jesus, this did not surprise the Father in heaven. And it was not by accident. But Jesus gave his life. Voluntarily gave his life for, to redeem and to provide a ransom for all mankind. Now let's look at the power of the resurrection. The scripture that we read from Philippians. Michael Rodelnik, who is a, a professor at Moody, Moody College and teaches Jewish history and is a Jew himself. He said that during the Roman Empire and the reign of the Roman Empire, 20,000 men were crucified. But only one was resurrected. That was Jesus Christ. The resurrection most graphically displays the extent of God's power equivalent to creation, if not greater. Power over death, which is the last enemy that we have. Power over the physical and spiritual world that we are enslaved to. The death experienced by Adam and Eve when they were deceived by Satan and gave in to temptation. They were separated from, it was, it was a spiritual separation. They were separated from a relationship with God himself. And because of this Adamic nature that we inherited through birth, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so let's not be too hard on Judas. Let's not be too hard on Peter. Let's not be too hard on the disciples for defecting and not following Jesus. Because we have that very same potential in our sinful hearts. We have our, our values turned upside down. We have loved the world. We've given in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And we've experienced that separation from God. Spiritual death from God. Philippians chapter 3, Paul did not say that I may know him, that I may know, but he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Simple, basic verse that we often quote. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. To only intellectually know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is not enough. Paul includes faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what brings salvation. Believing in Jesus, that he died, but faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what empowers us to be saved. We can agree with history. We can acknowledge it. But if we do not believe in the resurrection, then Paul says that I may know him, I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Many refuse to follow Jesus because of the fear of physical suffering. And we see that in the Gospels. The more Jesus pointed to the cross that was before him, and as he approached the death through the cross, less and less people were willing to follow him. And he died alone. 
When we read this text, the first thought that comes to my mind in the fellowship of his suffering is martyrdom. However, the focus is on becoming like him. And in death, And it's not necessarily talking about martyrdom or physical death. But we become like him as we are crucified with him in faith. And then we experience the resurrection of power in our lives to overcome death. Not necessarily, Paul is not necessarily referring to the method of death as in a physical death. And what Paul wants for himself in this text, and what he wants for us, is that through faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus, we could die to and not respond anymore to the world of sin and temptations that are around us. And we can be transformed and become Christ-like in our everyday walk of life. And today as we come to communion, that is the testimony that we are bringing. You are bringing a testimony or acting out a testimony and you are saying that, yes, I have in faith been crucified with Christ and I've died to sin and I'm responding to Jesus Christ and I'm living for him. And in my walk of faith, I am becoming more Christ-like as every day of my life. And that's what we are here to celebrate this morning as we come to the communion table. We are here to celebrate the ransom and the, the, the resurrection power in our own lives that we are walking in newness of life and we partake of this communion. We come to the communion table and we do this Traditionally, yeah, twice a year. We could do it oftener. Maybe we should do it oftener. Nothing wrong with doing it oftener. But we are testifying that we have been resurrected with Jesus Christ. And it's his life living within us that empowers us to live above sin. Stand with me. Larry, you can prepare the communion table. I want to go back to Mark and use this scripture that Jesus used in the Passover for the reading of the scripture before we partake of communion. In Mark chapter 10, verse 22, And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it. And he gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he went on to explain that this body, this bread, broken bread, symbolizes my broken body that I have given for you as a sacrifice to redeem you and to set you free from the bondage of sin. So as we partake of the bread, and I'm ask, I'll ask Judd and uh, Joe and Larry, and not Larry, Jarrett, to come forward and help serve communion. And those of you that are not partaking this morning, you may be seated so we know. And then we'll pass the bread to you, and you hold it in your hand, and then we'll all eat it together in remembrance of the suffering of Christ.